On August 28, 1963, more than 200,000 Americans gathered in Washington, D.C. for a rally. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom was organized by civil rights groups to bring attention to the struggle for equality faced by African Americans nationwide. The march became a key moment in the civil rights movement. Many leaders of the movement spoke that day, including Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. But only one woman was allowed to speak, Daisy Bates. Men such as Dr. King, John Lewis, Roy Wilkins, and Bayard Rustin had become the face of the movement. Yet behind these men stood hundreds of women such as Ida B. Wells, Ella Baker, Daisy Bates, and Diane Nash who made their responsibility to be the backbone of the civil rights movement. While not the public faces of the movement, these and countless other women were certainly important. Women had called for equal treatment since the late 19th century. Building on the legacy of Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, women became outspoken crusaders for freedom and equality and in the process changed the face of our nation. Ida B. Wells is best known for her work to end the horror of lynching and a push for voting rights for black women and citizens. But nearly 100 years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus, Wells refused to move to the inferior smoking car and was arrested not once, but twice. Originally a teacher, Wells wanted to spread her passion for social justice more broadly, so she turned to a career in journalism. She wrote countless newspaper articles and gave speeches calling for equal treatment of African Americans. She often risked her life to speak out openly, believing it was her responsibility to fight for change. Writing in Crusade for Justice, Wells' daughter, Alfreda Barnett Duster wrote, The most remarkable thing about Ida B. Wells Barnett is not that she fought lynching. It is rather she fought a lonely and almost single-handed fight with the single-mindedness of a crusader, long before men or women of any race entered the arena. Out of Wells' activism, the National Association for Colored Women was formed in 1896. It was the first national black organization to focus on issues of racial justice. Her willingness to risk harm for her beliefs inspired many others to speak out for equality. People have been made to understand that they could not look for salvation anywhere but to themselves, said Ella Jo Baker, another leader in the civil rights struggle. With her background as a community organizer, Baker knew that a valuable resource was being ignored. It was her goal to mobilize grassroots activists to rise up on their own behalf to fight for equality. Baker's contributions into shaping the civil rights movement began when she became the NAACP's Southern Field Secretary in the early 1940s. Her responsibility was to travel to the South and encourage black citizens to join the NAACP. She was planting the seeds for the sit-ins and protests that were to come. In fact, it was an interaction with Baker that sparked Rosa Parks' commitment to the cause, eventually leading to the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. Following the success of the bus boycott, which was largely fueled by women who were principal riders of bus transportation, Baker was energized. Here was the type of mass grassroots movements that could affect real change. Male leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. did not seem interested on the successful bus boycott. So despite the hope and energy generated within the African American community following the events in Montgomery, no subsequent mass protests immediately followed. And it may have stayed that way had it not been for Daisy Bates. Herself a strong believer in the power and responsibility of the black community to change their situation through nonviolent and organized action. Born in 1914, Daisy Lee Bates overcame the childhood tragedies of her mother's murder and father's abandonment. In the early 1940s, she and her husband moved to Little Rock, Arkansas, where they published Arkansas State Press, an African-American newspaper. At the paper, Bates became active in the civil rights movement and became the head of the Arkansas chapter of the NAACP in 1952. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregating schools based on race was unconstitutional, yet white Arkansas schools continued to turn away African-American students. Not be forcibly integrated or forcibly in, in 1957, the decision was made to integrate some schools in Little Rock. Bates played a key role 
by taking on the responsibility to mentor the nine black students who were selected to be the first to integrate Little Rock High School. Here is Daisy Bates not being an assistant, but being the leader. She was the one soldier that was willing to put her life on the battlefield for all those children. To say that there was a strong opposition to the school integration in Little Rock would be an understatement. The National Guard was called by the governor of Arkansas to keep the schools from being integrated, he said, for their own protection. After several weeks, the governor ordered the National Guard to withdraw. The resulting mob violence so shocked the nation that President Dwight Eisenhower ordered Army troopers to intervene to protect the students. Under unimaginable pressure and continued physical violence, Bates met with the students daily, giving them the courage to keep going to that school. Just as a baseball fan cannot think of the Dodgers without thinking of Jackie Robinson, it is impossible to think of the Little Rock Nine without thinking of their manager, Daisy Bates, with the NAACP's Polly Murray. One thing was clear, the federal government could not be counted on to take a leadership role in ensuring the Brown vs. Board of Education decision to end school segregation would happen peacefully. That task would fall to the people themselves. Once again, Ella Baker was at the forefront of pushing for a new form of grassroots activism. Joined by fellow civil rights veterans, Baird Ruskin and Stanley Levison, Baker helped create the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This group capitalized on the visibility and high profile of African American ministers, making Martin Luther King Jr. their leader. The first major push of the SCLC was voter registration drive, which King grudgingly allowed Baker to lead, but the effort did not receive much support from King and others, so the results were disappointing. This began a rocky relationship between Baker and King. It would take the activism of young college students from Greensboro NAACP Youth Group to once again ignite the spirit and excitement of the movement. On February 1st, 1960, four male freshmen held a peaceful sit-in at Woolworth's lunch counter, the first of many protests to follow. Baker persuaded King to organize a conference at Shaw University for these young protest leaders. Out of that conference was born the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1960. Baker advised SNCC leaders to rely on strength and contributions of all its members, male, female, black, and white. She kept daring us to go further, said John Lewis. He considered her our personal Gandhi, the spiritual mother, I guess I would call her. While never holding a formal title or office in SNCC, Baker was instrumental with her responsibility to shape the organization that would take the civil rights movement to the next stage in its evolution. Baker's conviction that it was the responsibility of each individual to fight for their freedom was once shared by an up-and-coming movement leader, Diane Nash. Nash was a central figure in the success of the Freedom Rise in 1961, but first got her feet wet in lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville. She was arrested and made bail that evening. The next day, rather than paying their fine, Nash, along with 15 others, announced they would go to jail instead. This action solidified her leadership status in the movement. John Lewis called her the most daring of leaders. Despite being the acknowledged leader, Nash was passed over as first chairman of SNCC in favor of a man. After the initial freedom rides ended in mob violence in Birmingham, Alabama, President John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. urged the riders to halt their plan to ride all the way to New Orleans. Diane Nash would have none of it, getting on the phone with James Farmer, asking if he would object if she brought students from Nashville to continue the ride. Farmer finally agreed, and from then on, Nash took on the responsibility of continuing the rides. Television coverage of the beating suffered by the nonviolent Freedom Riders shed an uncomfortable national and international spotlight on the racism and hatred in the South. The Freedom Rides resulted in the first clear victory of the modern civil rights era when, on November 1, 1961, the U.S. Interstate Commerce Committee ruled that all passengers could sit anywhere on interstate buses and trains. They also left a lasting imprint on the civil rights movement, marking the first time black and white northerners joined the movement in such large numbers and in such actionable ways. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of the March in Washington in August 2013, the pivotal role black women played in the quest for racial justice finally began to receive mainstream attention with coverage in the media. While black women are just now beginning to receive public recognition for their dedication and leadership roles, 
Ida B. Wells, Ella Baker, Daisy Bates, and Diane Nash will always be known for making it their responsibility to stand up for civil rights and become the backbone of the movement.